You ready? Yeah, start us off. Okay. What's going on, smart people? That's my thing. But... What's poppin', Bimjo? We'll work on it. <laughs> uh, how's it going, Space Invaders? That's actually not bad. So, what are we doing today? My name's Andrew. I put out a post in my community tab saying that Kelly is doing her PhD in astronomy. I love being able to answer questions about what studying physics entails, but once it gets into the astronomy-related questions, I'm just not the person for that. Uh, and I said if they had any questions for her about pursuing astronomy or wanted to know more, to leave them in the comments, and I was hoping you wouldn't mind answering some questions that people had. Sure. So a lot of these seem to be related to your PhD research in one way or another, so I thought a good jumping off point would be for you to kind of explain, you know, what do you do? What are you doing in grad school? Okay. Um, well, first off, my name's Kelly, like you said. Um, I'm a third year graduate student in the astronomy program, PhD astronomy program at New Mexico State University. Um, and my research is in extragalactic galaxy evolution um, with specifically focusing on the physical, physical conditions and the kinematics of gas outside of galaxies. Um, I'm mostly interested in how AGN, um, active galactic nuclei within these galaxies are affecting the gas. Um, and more recently I've been uh, becoming interested in different types of AGN, um, like radio loud versus quasar AGN. <laughs> so anytime you get to explain your research, it always sounds way more impressive than mine. Like, I studied, I studied galaxy, galaxy evolution, evolution, and here I am studying nucleus. Uh, the next question, or the first question says, is it true that getting the PhD is the comparatively easy part, and actually landing a research job is the hard part? Um, I don't think I can really comment on landing a job afterwards besides saying, I mean, because I'm still here, um, besides saying that I have heard that it is getting uh, more difficult for people in exoplanet research to get a job, like a research position job afterwards, just because exoplanets are new and fun and everyone, um, I feel like, got into that in grad school and now they're up those all all those same people are trying to find a job there's a saturation for that um field for sure so it's everyone's favorite answer it depends yeah <laughs> but we know people who are getting their phds and it does seem like across the board it's a really competitive competitive market mm. i know uh one of my previous advisors i won't name names but they said basically for getting a postdoc which is the logical next step after doing your phd if you want to do research uh you wait until all of the smarter people than you get jobs, and then you're next. Uh, the next comment says, what's the most mind-baffling fact you've come across in the course of your degree? Um, what are like some fun facts, I suppose? Yeah, mind-baffling, probably like a, a cool easy one that I think of is um, like with the expansion of space, we know that things are moving um, away from us. At, at some point, they can be moving away from each other faster than the speed of light. Right. And of course, we all say, like, oh, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Yeah, that's a good one. Do you have yeah. any others? Um, there's also the, I guess, a fun fact, the um, missing intermediate black hole problem where um, we can detect stellar mass size black holes and we can detect uh, the effects of supermassive black holes at the center of almost all, if not all, galaxies. Um, but we haven't really been able, no one's been able to detect or do much research on the intermediate population, like ones that have masses in between those two. Because we see the small ones, <laughs> we see the really massive ones, where are the ones that would... In between. Lead, yeah, lead to those. It's like if you went outside and you saw a bunch of old people and a lot of infants, but no teenagers. That's weird mm. to think about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question says, in your undergrad, did you take a lot of astronomy courses, or did you do more general physics courses and then specialize in grad school? So what was your undergrad background? Um, so I did a physics bachelor's in undergrad. We actually went to the same undergrad, ODU, um, and we both did physics, and there was actually only one astro class offered. It was just general astrophysics. Um, we both took that, but that was pretty much the extent of it. So I didn't really get to specialize in anything much until I started doing like internships and then once I got to grad school doing um, like actual research. That was a cool class though. Mm -hmm. We used the the Big Orange book, Bob. Yeah. Right? How, <laughs> okay, here we go. How annoyed would you be if someone confused astronomy with astrology? God. <laughs> I actually haven't had that happen too much, but, and I, when it does happen, I try not to get annoyed because I mean, words are hard and I get words confused all the time. Um, but they are completely different. Uh, one's a science, one is not. <laughs> uh, so the next one says, what is the hardest part of studying astronomy? 
And then following that, what is your favorite part? So what are some challenges you've come across with astronomy? So I think the hardest part is probably um, not being able to delve as deep into topics um, as you probably would in like a, a physics program or something. Like you, mm -hmm. you, these topics pop up and you, you either know them already and you just use them or you have to kind of like get a hand wavy idea of how to use it and then keep going. You don't really have time to um, delve into like the fundamentals of some certain to topics and subjects, um, which is frustrating because I have a hard time being able to use something if I don't understand it fully. Mm -hmm. So that's really frustrating. I think that's like the hardest part. Yeah, it's a difficult position for you to be in because you're literally covering a lot of ground there and then you can't but everything is made up of the smaller stuff that you also have to have a grasp of. So yeah. it's probably a lot of like cosmology meets atomic physics. That's a lot. Yeah. So now that I'm done with classes, I'd, I'd like to be able to go back and try and help myself understand some of those topics that were a little like uh, vague or hand wavy to me. Assuming this is true. Yeah. Next question is from my mom. Uh, Kelly's got her work cut out for her with all of these great questions. I still want to know what she wants for Christmas. I will text you, I promise. <laughs> Eventually. Uh, next one. If she could talk to any person slash scientist, because those are different, that ever existed, who would it be? Mm -hmm. um, just to like talk to someone, like have a conversation, I think I would probably like to talk to Feynman, just because he seems like he'd be... Good answer super easy going and like easy to talk to and have like a just conversation about anything with um but for like a, a famous scientist who i like really respect their work i mean not saying i don't respect Feynman's work but say like just to get to know them and and understand their thinking and their work i think um henrietta levitt would be interesting to talk to um she was the person who found a relationship between um cepheid stars and their luminosity and used that to derive like distances and her method of deriving distances to other galaxies was later used by hubble to in, in conjunction oh, wow. with um best of slifer's work on redshift to figure out that the universe was expanding so she was like the foundation for that that's really part cool. of the foundation for that and Vesto Slifer sounds like a Star Wars character. It sounds like a cool name, right? What undergrad physics and math topics do you use most in grad school or your own research? Um, for math, the thing that comes to mind that I think I've seen the most is a lot of differential equations, which... That makes sense. Makes sense, right? Because I'm looking at evolution. Um, and I mean, I think we do that a lot in astronomy, look at evolution of things, and so... Um, Differential equations come in a lot. Um, for physics, I think all of the topics like mechanics, quantum mechanics, ENM, um, stat mech, thermo, they all pop up here and there in different classes. Um, the amount of them that's used depends on that class or the research that you're doing. Um, but they, I think they all pop up at one point or another, at least in my classes. But like the degree depends kind of on the specialty. Yeah, I like, imagine. like. I think in planetary we there was some like Kepler's law stuff and um, mechanics sure. stuff, but I don't think I've had to use that since I took planetary. And for those of you who are maybe not there yet for differential equations, that's relating something. There are equations that relate something to how it changes. So naturally, if you're talking about how things evolve over time, that would be a pretty important branch of math. Or so. involve within space, like yeah, or like space that. absolutely. Like in a star, there's variations and yeah stuff like that uh so the next question says do astronomy and astrophysics grad school courses have a lot of overlap in terms of material um there, so i wouldn't really say astronomy and astrophysics are different um i don't know if anyone would disagree with that i think some people on google would probably disagree but um yeah i've heard they're maybe have historical differences, but have really become yeah. the same thing. Yeah, I think that's what I've heard too. If there, like, if there is a department that decides to differentiate between them, I think the main difference might be that astrophysics focuses more on the theory, but there's still so much overlap and theory that goes on in astronomy. So I, I don't know, I wouldn't really call them different topics. Uh, the next one is, what is the prospect of actually getting a job in astronomy after doing a PhD. So I think we kind of touched on that where it's, 
you know, you're, you're probably going to do a postdoc if you're going into academia. Yeah. Do you have anything else to add to that? Um, yeah. I think your chances of getting a job after getting your PhD are probably better if you're able to network or meet people or get connections. Mm -hmm. Like when you go to conferences or um, visit different departments or programs, um, I think talking to people and getting to know other people and asking them about their research and just making connections with people can definitely increase your mm -hmm. your chances of that. Um, yeah, my, my advisor actually mentioned uh, there are researchers who do things that are somewhat related to what I do. And he said, you know, get your get your foot in that door. That way, in their next talks, and they're talking about what's going on in this realm right now, they may mention what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you're building that name recognition as well for maybe where you'll be pursuing jobs in the future. Yeah, and I don't even think it's just like sucking up or like trying to network with people who are above you mm -hmm. in their in their career. I think even networking with people who are at other grad programs is still helpful because they're going to have to give talks too and they're going to be looking for jobs too or they might get a job before you. Right. You never know what could happen. All right, now we're moving on to the important question. Uh, how does gastronomy compare to astronomy and is the extra G worth the effort? Thoughts? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I wasn't entirely sure what gastronomy was. Me neither. Before this, but apparently it has something to do with food. Yep. But I was, yeah, I, I read that and I was wondering if it's like science of culinary arts or if it's like science of like how your body handles food. It's an open question and uh, we leave it to you in the comments to answer that. Two questions. COVID notwithstanding, how much does your astronomy PhD let you travel? Do you get to travel to the telescopes to gather data? Yada, yada, yada. Second question. Uh, more frequent astronomy meme review, please. <laughs> We should do that. Yeah. That'd um, be fun. COVID was standing. I think I traveled like once a year um, before COVID started, like for astronomy purposes, um, like for conferences. I went to uh, Hawaii this past January, um, Seattle the January before that. Um, last summer, I went to Denmark with my advisor and got to do some work like at the. Um, Dark Cosmology Center, which mm -hmm. is like partnered with the Niels Bohr Institute, so that was really cool being um, being there because it's such a big name or big institution in physics and astronomy. Um, yeah, so when we're not in a pandemic, <laughs> I mean that kind of leads into. I think I uh, cut you off before you answered maybe the, a different question that was talking about what are the hard parts of astronomy. They also ask, what are your favorite? Mm. Did you, I don't think you don't answered think I that. Answer I don't think that. I let you answer that. Sorry. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I like all the aspects of being an astronomer, but I think traveling is probably my favorite. But I mean, I also like um, observing is really fun. I kind of like being up in the middle of the night when no one else is. It's kind of <laughs> cool. Um, I think I'm, not, I'm just not huh. a night owl, so I'm not really used to that. But I kind of like it because it's like a different feel. Um, I like traveling to observatories. That's really fun to get to do. Um, and I really like the coding aspect. Mm. I don't know. I like all the parts of it, but I think traveling, if I had to pick one, traveling is the, the best. What courses for astronomy do you take in grad school? So what are the, some, some of the top courses you've had to take? Um, I've taken a couple of galaxy courses, um, stellar spectroscopy, where you learn about stellar spectra, um, <laughs> and like how they're made. Um, from the atmospheres of stars and stuff like that, um, which I don't study stars, but that class was interesting because you learn about like absorption lines in spectra, and that's something that comes up um, in galaxy research. Um, what else? Stellar dynamics, um, stellar interiors, a lot of star classes. Planetary, um, I took a couple planetary classes. Radio, um, which sadly isn't offered in my department anymore because the professor retired. Did you say cosmology? So the cosmology class was part of the second galaxies class that I took. It was I like see. a galaxies two slash cosmology, but um, that was a really fun class. I feel like I learned a lot. I feel like there's more. I can't remember. Maybe we can add the um, yeah the course catalog or whatever. To... We'll make sure to add any that we left out. Uh, so speaking of classes, is there one that stands out as being the most interesting class you took in grad school? My galaxies classes were a lot of fun, and I think the cosmology portion of the second galaxy class was 
really interesting because I liked learning about like um, history and evolution of the universe and like information about the CMB and inflation and stuff like that is just I think that's the one I had the most fun with. Um, so what made it more fun than others? Just the topic is just more interesting or the math was more fun or what? I think I was interested in the in the topic. Um, the math was fun um, solving like I mean I think that's where I first learned about like metrics and mm -hmm. um, GR stuff. Um, and I think that the professor who taught it was just really good at making it interesting and um, interactive and stuff like that. Okay, so the the next question, so we're probably only going to do a couple more questions, but this one says, can Kelly share her experience with the oral exam like I did in my previous video? So you also had to do an oral exam. What was that like? Scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was... In the moment, I, I get really nervous um, with exams in general, and then oral exams are like an extra added level of scary to me um so in the moment i felt really stressed but um i think looking back at it i don't think i did as bad as i felt like i did in the moment um but it's basically uh, a coursework oral so i sat down with like four different professors um so you have a, a committee yeah so we have our committee and then they basically just ask me questions about courses that i've taken um and they can be anything like I think some people who take that exam, their committee asks them questions that are more closely related to their research. Other people, it's like random. It could be any question from that course. I think I got that that That's latter what it experience like. where it was just like random things that I learned from those classes. Um, but yeah, it was intimidating at first, but I think looking back, I feel like I, I did a good job um, with like not getting too stressed out and trying to treated as a learning experience because there were the purpose of the exam is to basically ask you questions until you can't answer questions anymore because they're trying to probe the depth of your knowledge and I think once it got to those points where I like didn't really know how to answer the question um, it ended up turning into more of a conversation mm -hmm. and it ended up being like a learning experience so it was pretty cool I ended up like walking away with some new information or new ideas of like looking at something or thinking of something it's definitely it's scary in the moment though I think I cried for couple hours afterwards but I can vouch for that <laughs> uh, yeah so those of you watching choose your committee wisely they they definitely were there to support me though like I could tell that they wanted me to do well which was nice to have like mm -hmm. um, faculty who actually care about your success so this one says can you please explain the whole process like what did you do in high school after that and the courses you took to pursue the PhD so already did the courses part but how did you get here Okay, um, well, I was born in, <laughs> no, um, I always liked math a lot when I was growing up, like in middle and high school, but I was like struggling a lot with my other classes until like halfway through high school, I got diagnosed with ADD. Um, and then I started doing really well in all of my classes. Uh, but the one that I enjoyed the most was the physics class. And I was doing really well in that one and I found it super interesting and I was at the same time trying to figure out like, okay, high school's almost over, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and I, my professor, or my teacher uh, who instructed that class, I think he had an internship with NASA previously and he like was really into NASA and talked about it all the time and had like NASA suspenders and <laughs> he was just like a space freak. Um, and he kind of got me interested in astronomy. And so when I applied to undergrad, I had the idea that I was going to go um, into an engineering program and try and do aerospace engineering. Um, but after taking a couple classes, I think I took like one or two classes. Um, and so like after a year of being an undergrad, I realized that I was more interested in the nature of space than like sending things to space or traveling, space travel, stuff like that. Um, and so I kind of shifted, I switched my major from engineering to physics um and then from there i yeah started taking physics classes um but there i think we mentioned before there's only one astronomy class at our undergrad and so we took that but then i didn't really have any other options for astronomy um so eventually i, I tried to get a job at the planetarium on campus uh, where i met my first mentor um, justin and um, he basically guided me later towards um, like applying for internships and applying later applying to grad school and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and then 
So I got a few internships over the last few years that I was in undergrad and then eventually got into New Mexico State uh, University and here we are. are. That planetarium was awesome. Yeah. By the way. It's great. We used to do our SPS like game nights there so we would go to her planetarium and we would project like Smash Bros onto the dome. Sneak in after dark. Yeah. Um, that's where you did your first, your, uh, not your first, but the, if you laugh, you lose yeah. video it was recorded in the planetarium. It should not have gotten as many, <laughs> as much attention as it did. That's supposed to like be for us. And that, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and do two more. So this <laughs> one says, what's better for a grad school application? One professor you've done research with for two to three years and knows you well, or two to three professors who you've done small projects with. So it sounds like this is like a a very stellar letter from one person versus three letters from and research multiple different avenues of research experience. Mm -hmm. That's a tough question. Um, yeah, it is a tough question. I'm not really sure how to answer that because I I did the second one where I had like two or three different um, research experiences and so I worked with two or three different professors um, or scientists and um, but I only applied to for grad school so I don't know how much I don't know like what the cause and effect of like mm -hmm. how their letters affected me getting into grad school doing multiple research projects is good for you because it gives you more more of an idea of like what you're interested in mm -hmm. or versus what you're Absolutely. not interested in like um, my first project was I didn't touch any astronomy um, like observations I was working with simulation data um, with for galaxies my second one, I was looking at radio observations of a star um, or a binary system. And then my third one, um, eventually, I yeah, started doing radio observations of galaxies. And so from that second one, it was a really great experience. And um, my advisor was super awesome. But I realized that I wasn't really into stellar astronomy um, that much. I mean, it sounds, I mean... Two to three years across the board, regardless of if it's with multiple professors or one, that's a lot of research experience. So yeah. I think that's really good for anyone. Mm -hmm. That's what you should prioritize in any way that you can do that is yeah, as man. much research as you can. So physics, you have uh, SULI and REU programs. What do you have for astronomy? I think STSI does some stuff. Uh, I did mine through the NREO's NAC program. Um, yeah, I mean, you can apply like specifically to a bunch of different schools, like every program that I had, it was funded through NAC, but then there was a separate group of students at that same institution who were there through that institution's program. So there's like plenty, like almost every school will have um, mm -hmm. a program that you can apply to. And then there's professors within your own department who may need help over yeah. the summer that's worth reaching out to. I think our last year before we left, Ray Rogers yeah. um, came up and asked both of us if we were interested in working with him so yeah i think yeah just the experience is is probably the most important part i don't even think most people have more than one um yeah one is mandatory i would say mm. any more is icing on the cake yeah so i don't think anyone's expecting anyone to apply to grad school with two is is pretty good yeah. but like you know so. But I think doing the multiple, it's more beneficial for you because it gives you some direction, which is, I guess, useful when you're writing your application essays because then you can be more certain about what you want. But that's not necessarily um, super important. But the important thing, I think, is like if you go into a program um, and you apply to be part of a certain research group, you don't necessarily, at least in my department, you don't ha you're not married to that idea. Like you can come in and start working with stellar people, do some research in that area and decide hmm, I think I like galaxies more and it's totally okay to switch. So knowing yeah. what you want to do before you get to grad school isn't the most important thing, at least in what I've experienced. I think having the drive and like the passion for research is more That's important. That's what you're demonstrating is you're like, yeah, I'm taking the steps to make sure that this is what I, they're, they're going to yeah. invest in you doing a PhD. So they want to make sure you've taken the steps to, to learn that you like research or not. Yeah. So yeah, that's a really good point. That's pretty much all of the ones that I've highlighted so far. So I thank you for answering all these people's questions. Um, Hopefully we can we can answer some more at some point if you guys have more. And if there's anything that um, I said that you guys want me to expand upon, um, feel free to comment on that in the, in the comment section. Um, and maybe we'll make another one of these. <laughs> Thanks for watching.